Well, hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. In this AI revolution that we're seeing at the moment, we talk a lot about all of the exciting developments that it allows, like we just heard from our last panel. We talk about the amazing capabilities of things like ChatGPT, but I would argue that just as important, perhaps even more important, is uh, the pipes that power AI, the infrastructure behind it. And I'm delighted to have with me today two key figures from two of the biggest companies in the world that are working on this. David from NVIDIA, hello, um, and Mike from CoreWeave, uh, which has just launched in the UK. Um, key partners of one another. Now, um, Mike, I don't know if you want to, to kick off. For, for those in the room who might not have heard of CoreWeave, so you're yep. a really significant player in this field, but you've only just moved to the UK. Can you explain what it is that you do? Yeah, so if you think about CoreWeave's business, um, we, we are that AI hyperscaler. And to put this into context, the, the legacy hyperscalers have been building their, their cloud offerings off the back of CPU and compute. Um, our, our infrastructure, our cloud is based off of NVIDIA technology, GPU compute and networking, um, and is ultimately the engine behind all of the AI progress that you'll, you'll see in the market today. So if you go back a little bit in our history, you know, our business really blew up around um, a little bit three or four months after ChatGPT launched and had huge adoption across the market. So we um, were ready with scale with GPU infrastructure in the US. We had about three or four data centers at the time, and, and we scaled off the back of the ChatGPT momentum very quickly to the point now where we're going to have 28 data centers across the US and Europe uh, by Christmas of this year. And purely working for artificial intelligence, so your yeah, customers are... Yeah, 100%. So our, our cloud is designed um, purely for AI, AI use cases. Now, David, you've been working at NVIDIA for, for what, eight years? Eight years, yes, Pro correct. Probably before people knew how to pronounce NVIDIA. Yes. And, um... This hasn't been an overnight success. <laughs> And yet now you're what, one of, almost one of the most valuable companies in the world. Valuation <laughs> saw past $3 trillion, I think, again. Yes. Um, tell us about that journey in, in Europe in particular. So what was it like when you started? And, and what does the company here look like now? So when we started, uh, I had a team of four people um, trying to explain what AI was and what the opportunity for AI at the time, it was something called deep learning. Uh, was, a, was a technique that would really transform every organization. Um, but you know, we, when you start off, you have to explain, first of all, what AI is. You have to explain the technology. You have to explain why what was then a gaming company was moving towards AI and how that would be transformative. And over the last eight years, we've slowly seen how organizations are starting to adopt AI and how it starts to transform their business. And now with generative AI, it's been turbocharged to a, you know, amazing scale, which is which is fantastic. And it's great to sit here without really having to explain who Nvidia is. Well, to the point that your boss is like a rock star, and your conferences are more like concerts. Uh, well, I can't pull off the leather jacket, <laughs> but yes. Um, just explain to us then how you work with a company like CoreWeave that uses yeah. your technology. Um, so in, NVIDIA has a, an indirect model. In, NVIDIA very much believes that everybody should benefit from AI. So although NVIDIA builds a full stack, so hardware, software, the applications, et cetera, to prove out the technology, we like to make that available to as many organizations to add their capability, their secret source, their value to that, and take that to market in their own right. And these environments that we talk about today for generative AI, we referenced ChatGPT, which was uh, trained on NVIDIA. These are very, very complex environments to build, um, and it's a new way of doing computing. And therefore, we need partners to help organizations take that on board, be able to develop and deploy that at scale. And therefore, it's really critical we have partners like CoreWeave who can take that infrastructure and help organizations adopt it. And more importantly, scale. AI is a scale challenge. And therefore, it, you know, trying to make thousands of GPUs and networking various things work together is one of the, the critical factors in being successful with generative AI. Now, Elon Musk famously said not that long ago that it was harder to get hold of your GPUs than buy <laughs> drugs in Silicon Valley. Um, what's, what's it like in, in Europe? Uh, I don't mean buying drugs. I mean, in terms of the demand for NVIDIA products and who, who's, who's after them? 
what I would say is uh, initially, clearly, you see the AI startups, particularly the generative AI ones, needing you know compute and compute very very quickly to establish uh, their market position. But what we've seen now over the last sort of six to nine months is the average enterprise realizing actually in order to remain competitive, in order to be able to transform their business, they need to start adopting AI. So actually, you see an organization saying, actually, I need my own AI factory, the ability to generate my own insight, my own intelligence, and own that as their own IP, and be able to sort of start you know, delivering that as a service to their customers. Which, which I guess, Mike, is why you decided to bring Cool Weave to the yep. UK. So though you've got a British accent, you've actually been based into, into the yep. States till, till recently. What sort of demand are you seeing here? So are you just re referenced Elon talking about h 100 So if you, as somebody in Europe today, want to spin up a H100, um, it's near impossible um, if you look at the market today. So there are small pockets of capacity available, but there's just really nothing at scale um, that you can work with as it is today. So obviously for us, uh, initially, um, the thought of coming to Europe, we have large customers that are global customers um, and they need our compute, our infrastructure, our software in, in Europe as, as quickly as possible. So that's been a piece of that. So we're already working with those customers. But then also if you look across the, there's so much talent in Europe, in Paris, in London, in Sweden, in Poland, there's so many countries, so much talent, but they don't have the access to the infrastructure um, to, to do the work and take their, take their companies, their, their projects, whatever they're working on to the next level. So there's two pronged approach for us. One is bringing um, compute for existing customers to enterprises. There's a lot of enterprises in Europe with a lot of data that need to make the step into AI, but they don't have access to compute today. And then really importantly for us as well is getting hands, um, compute in the hands of developers uh, across the region so they can work on the next big thing in Europe and catch up with the US. And when you see people working on the next big thing, is the demand coming from startups, from bigger organizations? What does that picture look like? It's really a little bit of everywhere. The startups are going to move quicker. They're going to be more aggressive. Um, they want to get to work on this now. The enterprises are trying to work out what to do. They have all of this data. Maybe they have a budget, maybe they don't. So they're still working through things. It's a bit of a slower process. But with the startups, they want to start today and they're really constrained in Europe as it stands today. And what are your plans here in London in terms of opening data center capacity? Yeah, so we have our plan. We made an announcement um, around three weeks ago now in a billion pound investment into, into the UK. And, and that's going to help us deploy two data centers in the London region as quickly as possible um, and enable us to put infrastructure online in Q4 of this year to the market as well. So that's our first initial plan for the UK. And then, you know, we have plans to, to grow beyond that pretty quickly pretty rapidly as well. Thank you. And when it, when it comes to data center infrastructure and this mm. huge thirst that there is for compute, how much support do you feel you're getting from policymakers? Sort of how easy is it to, to roll that out in, in the UK and in Europe? Yeah, I, I think you see um, a lot of good um, direction being set by governments. A lot of people saying, yes, AI is important, infrastructure is important. What is sort of slower to come is actually the funding and the investment to actually allow uh, countries, organizations to really take advantage of the opportunity that's presented. So I, I think there's a lot of good direction, but it'd be great to see the investment flow, which really enable industry to adopt AI and compete internationally, which uh, was just being referenced by Mike. So I think really it's about the application of that um, investment into the right areas, into data centers, into skills to really help people adopt and, and scale and, and compete. Thank you. And when, when it comes to building any sort of infrastructure like this, it's always going to be a little bit controversial. Um, how have you found things like planning permission, support from local authorities when you're talking about rolling out data centers? Yeah, I mean, so most of our work today and probably for the next two years, there's, there's a decent amount of data center capacity available in the market today. But what we're actually having to do as we speak is basically upgrade that to be ready for the next round of technologies coming from NVIDIA in Q4 of this year. So moving from air cool to liquid cooled, and, you know, we have enough capacity to work on today. But this is a long lead time cycle to get more capacity in place. Um, so we have to um, do everything possible in Europe to make sure that there aren't barriers to getting access to power, to getting planning permission to build more data centers um, and keep things moving along. 
And power is absolutely crucial when it comes to data centers. What does that look like in the UK? Yeah, I mean, there's, there is, there, there are pockets of power. What, what you're seeing pretty often now is there's an old, old auto factory or a, a, there's a paper mills, these kind of old businesses that have pockets of power allocated to them today. So what we're doing is getting sites like that and converting them into data centers. And there's quite a bit of opportunity to do that. And then obviously we've got new construction going on. Um, and typically the new construction, that's where we're working on multi-year planning and getting approval to build data centers. But in the interim, there, there are quite a few sites that we can take existing power and retrofit them and get them stood up as data center. Fascinating. Um, um, you were talking there about how, when you roll out different chips, mm. you get them to your partners. It's something I've always been fascinated by. You hear Jensen standing up in his leather jacket announcing the next big yeah. NVIDIA chip. And you think, well, hang on a second. Why would anyone buy the last one when they're <laughs> waiting, waiting for that one? How do you roll that out with your yes. partners? So, so now we have a, an annual cadence. So we basically announce a new, uh, new architecture every year. But it, it takes um, a while for people to build the right data center architecture. This is a new type of computing platform. It's a new architecture. It takes time for the ecosystem to adapt. So we need to start sort of educating and informing the market. We're going to move with this new architecture. And it also takes time for the, the community, the developers, to realize, actually, what could I do if I had this opportunity with this new technology? What more could I, you know, could I address? How could I change my models, et cetera? And therefore, really, we're signaling ahead of time to say, hey, this is coming. Start to think about it. While you're developing currently now on this technology, be aware there's this opportunity to go beyond that with the next generation. So the next one coming out is Blackwell. Blackwell will be here in uh, Q4 this year. And then Ruben. Ruben will be 26. Yeah. Okay. And so, and how does that work with CoreWeave then? Will you have access to Blackwell? Yeah. So we'll, for we'll your... be receiving Blackwell product and starting to deploy in the US um, in Q4 of this calendar year. And then we're getting data centers ready to start deploying Q1 um, of next year right. in Europe. So obviously Europe's, the, the infrastructure is a little bit behind, so we're getting it all ready to go. And we'll be deploying, um, I think, at least 18 month, months before any other um, at scale in Europe. So we're really excited to get it into Europe's hands, get Gosh. the infrastructure in Europe's hands. What's the lag then between the US and, and Europe when it comes to AI processes? We have to get the data centers ready. All right, okay. All right. Yep. <laughs> And um, does the advances in the chips then change the infrastructure at all? Does that change your business? Does it mean you can have smaller data centers? Yeah, I mean, look, we, we, there is so much demand. Whatever data centers we have access to, we're going to fill them. Um, that's going to be the way for a, a hell of a long time. I don't see that slowing down anytime soon. Um, but with the new infrastructure that's coming, obviously, um, it, we're moving from air-cooled technology to liquid-cooled technology. So they're pretty big energy savings associate, associated with that, but also with the Blackwell product, you're looking at, depending on the use case, um, if you're training, it's a three to four X um, throughput improvement. For, for inference, we're seeing in the range of 25 to 30 times improvement as well. So, you, and it's less compute that you have to physically deploy to get to that performance. But whatever data center we have, we will fill it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and how about you, when you look in, ahead to the next decade of NVIDIA, where, where do you see things going in terms of AI infrastructure? Yeah, I, I think clearly we're going to keep innovating and keep driving things forward. Uh, energy efficiency and the density will, will continue. Energy efficiency is a key thing. And as you just referred to, Blackwell is 25% more energy efficient than the previous generation. And we'll continue to, to focus on that. I, I think in terms of broader direction, I think it's really how we pe help people innovate, not just at the chip level, but at the software level. Um, a lot of the innovation we do is actually in software. We've improved the performance of our existing uh, hopper generation by nearly 30% in the last 12 months just through software. So we're continually innovating and improving performance and efficiency all the time. And that really has benefits from adoption from the enterprise, from organizations, as they start to realize the benefit of what this technology can do. It is a really transformative technology. People see it very much as the, you know, the next thing, the next internet. But if you think about how fundamentally it affects every type of industry and the vast array of different use cases, it is a bit like the next industrial revolution. And I think that's where the UK and Europe has a huge opportunity. You were saying before we came on stage that you meet up regularly with 300 
AI startups are a month in, in the UK. What, yeah. what, what do they ask you? What do they want from NVIDIA? Uh, GPUs, usually. <laughs> um, so so, so what, they, what they need more than anything else is access to funding. Um, you know, the US and, and Asia has been particularly good at funding uh, a lot of the startups. The UK and Europe is getting much better. Um, but that's one of the key things is access to capital. Um, it's also access to skills and being able to hold on to the skills in the UK and Europe and not have them go to, to the US or other parts of the world. Um, and what they also need is, is help with, um, you know, they want to focus on building their model. They don't want to really worry about building the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. That's an additional complexity to run these environments. And that's why, obviously, the announcement call with is very welcome because you know, they, they want to focus to building the next application that's going to transform an industry or healthcare or whatever it may be. And, and that's really where they want to focus their time, not necessarily worrying about how they're going to operationalize their data center. There's clearly huge demand for NVIDIA power, for power for AI. Is there going to be a point when, you know, you're, you're going to meet that? when supply will meet demand, you think? <laughs> then, then you won't be in a situation where you've got 300 AI developers begging for GPUs. Um, I think the, the moves by, by Cool Women and Partners to, to deploy infrastructure will help Europe in particular. I think you know, it's been a big challenge to get compute into Europe at scale. There's been huge demands in other regions, and, that, that's, and they moved a lot quicker. Um, you know, the US and Asia moved probably two years before Europe, really, and we're trying to catch up right now. Um, I, I think you'll see the, the situation improve significantly in terms of access to compute, but there is vast amounts of demand out there. And as uh, generative AI gets built into many of the applications that you see today, how many people use SAP or any such of things, all those applications will need compute to support the generative AI functions in them. So it, the, the opportunity continues to, to grow. Continues to grow, yeah. It's very interesting, both of you here working for an American company as Brits and having spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley. Mike, I just wonder what reflections have you had coming back to the UK about the tech scene here, how it compares to the US, and perhaps how it's changed since you were last year? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the challenge Europe always has is access to capital. Um, so obviously, Silicon Valley is pretty unique in the way that you know, you can pitch an idea and get funding pretty quickly. Obviously, it's just not the same here. I think what I would say with just looking at more how we can catch up, so governments are participating, governments are thinking about funding infrastructure across Europe. It couldn't be more important because I think the fastest way to get um, the European, UK European tech scene caught up is with governments coming in and st stimulating as well. Obviously, as we are doing as well with a private investment mm. to put infrastructure in place. But I think we have incredible talent, we have incredible work ethic, incredible creativity across you know, London, Paris, I mentioned earlier, Poland, Sweden. We've got a lot of great, we have a lot of engineers in Sweden today. We're, we're putting a team in, in Poland, we have in the UK and looking at France as well. And there's great talent here, we just need to get the, the access to funding and compute and things will move fast. Thank you. D David, how, what are your reflections on that? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I speak to European governments all the time, something else. We have a great history in industry. We, you know, a lot of the industrial revolution started in Europe. We have vast amounts of skilled people. We have vast amounts of intellectual property. What we need to be able to do is leverage that with generative AI to really transform how these businesses operate. And I think the UK and Europe can compete very well internationally. And we're seeing it happen as you, I think your investment and so many of the other investments from the big US tech companies we've seen in the last few months yeah. have proven. Well, thank you very much, both of you, uh, for being here today. Um, I think it's, it is one of those things that um, it's, it's as important, as I say, as some of the applications that we're seeing built in AI is you guys who are building all of the vital infrastructure behind it. So can I have a round of applause, please, for Mike Matakola from CoolWeave and David Hogan from NVIDIA. Thank you. Thank you.